We can't gather in person this year, but we've adapted. The 2020 Milwaukee Film Festival brings the best in film from across the globe and around the corner. And this year, it's all virtual. So the films and events are coming directly to you. Join us for the 2020 Milwaukee Film Festival, October 15th through the 29th. More information is at mkefilm.org slash MFF. Good morning and welcome to day 12 of the 2020 Milwaukee Film Festival presented by Associated Bank. We definitely appreciate you for tuning in this morning. I'm Tiana, Community Outreach Coordinator for the Black Lens Program, and we are here for a conversation exploring the African immigrant experience, a conversation with Ekwa Msangi, the Director of Farewell Amor. Don't forget, to cast your vote for the Allen H. Budd and Susan L. C. League Audience Award. To do that, visit the film or shorts program at watch.milwaukeefilm.org, log in with your pass or ticket code, and click the button that says vote now, and you will be connected to the form that serves as your ballot. Please do not tear your computer screen. As you've seen, we have a double up challenge happening. Thanks to the generosity of Judith McGregor and Richard Gallum, if we raise 75,000 during the film festival, they will double it. So text double up to 44321 to donate or go to milwaukeefilm.org backslash members to become a member and help us meet our goal. We are halfway there, so please donate today. Milwaukee Film couldn't do what we do during the festival as well as through the year without the, without the support of our members. Members get access to free films throughout the year, discounts on tickets, passes, and more. Plus, our members keep the nonprofit Milwaukee Film going. If you think that sounds appealing, join us. If you are already a member, thank you and help us spread the word. And I always want to give a special shout out to our Black Lens Council members. Wherever you're watching us live, drop your questions and comments in the chat or comment section, and we'll put them in our conversation. And now, here's Miela Fatal, freelance journalist and filmmaker to facilitate this conversation with Equa Msangi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Chiana. Good morning, everyone mm -hmm. who might be watching, and welcome to day 12 of the 2020 Milwaukee Film Festival. My name is Miela Fatal. I'm a journalist and filmmaker here in Milwaukee. And this morning, I have the pleasure of moderating a necessary conversation, exploring the African immigrant experience with Ekwa Masangi. Ekwa is a Tanzanian American filmmaker who grew up in Kenya and is based in the United States. She has directed several short films, including Farewell Mi Amor, which she chose to expand to feature length for her first narrative feature project, Farewell and More made its world premiere at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and has been picked up for distribution in the US by IFC Films. Ekwa, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Congratulations on your directorial debut and all of the successes you've had uh, with Farewell and More. It was truly a beautiful film. I, I've seen it two and a half times. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, Equa, your directorial debut, you know, tells a story of an Angolan immigrant who nearly after two decades apart is joined in the, in the U.S. by his mm -hmm. wife and daughter. How did your own family history inspire this beautiful film? Yeah. Um, so it was inspired by a relationship of an aunt and uncle of mine who... Uh, we're married in the mid nineties in Tanzania. My uncle got a student visa to come to the US and came with every intention of bringing my aunt and cousin behind and have been caught in visa applications um, since then, 2020. They're still petitioning for visas, still hopeful that one day it will happen for them. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very common story. Um, amongst all immigrants, not just African immigrants. I just happen to be closer to that particular group. Um, and so just kind of seeing how it had affected their lives and their personalities, who they were, who they had to become in order to stay hopeful that this could work. Um, 
it made me think about the what if question. What would happen if Auntie got her visa suddenly and you know, the doors are open and now you get to come. You know, this is the thing that they've been, they've been climbing the mountain with this boulder forever and ever. And finally the boulder's gone. Then what do you do? You know, so that's, that was the inspiration or the, you know, the kernel that started that idea for Farewell Amor. I am so sorry. Oh, technical difficulties. I <laughs> the life of Zoom. I I get it. No problem. <laughs> you know, this is the first time that I've that my Wi-Fi just did that in the entire year we've been in this pandemic. Um, yeah, keeping it interesting. No problem. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I'm not sure which part of the question you may have heard, or maybe no one got that. Um, but I was curious to know. Why focus on the reunion and let's say the goodbye? I, I couldn't help but wonder, especially during the beginning of the film, shouldn't this film be titled Welcome Amor as opposed to Farewell Amor? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I mean, technically, yes, because that's the idea, right? Is that, yay, we made it, we're here together, the end, but it's really the beginning. And in order to, in order to have the relationship that they want, in order to actually be a family, they're having to say goodbye to who they were, to loves that they had. Um, not only in terms of you know what Walter is doing and saying in terms of saying goodbye to Linda, but you know saying goodbye to their old lives, saying goodbye to their old selves. You know, it's it's a. Um, you know, we, when we were working with the actors, I was talking to them about how each character has had a crutch, has developed some sort of crutch in order to survive this um, separation. And now they've come into this relationship, into this family unit with their crutches and are realizing that the crutch isn't working in this new territory. And so they're having to say goodbye to that in order to actually have the, the experience that they want that they've dreamt of, but you know, their dreams of what it would be is not actually 
real. <laughs> it's not true. It was a dream, you know, it was my assumption of what you're like, my assumption of what I'm like um, is not necessarily what's actually in front of us. And at some point they actually have to figure out what is in front of them and accept that and say, and in order to accept that they need to say goodbye mm -hmm. to what was there before. So um, so that, that's why the title, um, in terms of why that being the focus, um, I just thought it was an interesting journey to look at, you know, I mean, when you think about, well, specifically with African films, African the African films that tend to get made, that tend to get financed, um, tend to be of a few categories, you know, either like the most exceptional human being that ever lived, or, you know, sort of like the problem ridden, you know, challenges abound, you know, be it child soldiers, be it FGM, be it Boko Haram, you know, whatever, fill in the blank issue. And so telling a story about the problems that they had during the war and where she had to run to and da da da, da just felt like, yeah, we've seen that, but it to me that doesn't actually talk about them. Um, and I wanted to talk, I wanted to like really focus on them and and in the background of this dreamland, you know, we've been dreaming of coming to the US, we've been dreaming of coming to New York and we've seen postcards and we've written letters and, you know, we've just conjured up all of these things in our minds about what life is going to be. And then we're in the dreamland, it, it worked, but it's, it's not the dream. It's not the dream that I had in my mind. So that's why. Thank you. Um, and, and let me say, you know, as an African immigrant myself, it was, why I was so attached to this film, other than I, I have family members like this who have experienced mm -hmm. this. I have an uncle who just reunited with his daughter after after 12 years. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't, it was still um, somewhat tragic without showing tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, new for like yeah. films that get funded by African filmmakers. Yeah. Why, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, that was it. I was acknowledging what you were saying. <laughs> uh, why did you choose dance as uh, the common denominator? Because I love it. Um, because I love it. Because I love it, period. But also, <laughs> because why not? Because Africans, Black people and dance, like that's such a religious experience for us you know it's not just random movement you know dance is associated to so much it's associated to memory it's associated to the keeping of culture the transference of culture the understanding of what you know there's i i dance a lot um and there's clubs that i go to in new york where you like certain songs will come on and like people will just be like transported to a time and a place and like the emotion and the feeling and you know so it's all like part of um it's all part of our experience as african heritage people specifically but when you are in exile or when you are away from home or away from you know family loved ones i feel like dance and music serves an even more important role where it's like memory and, you know, it's like the thing that you hold on to. And so um, I practice Kizomba dancing, Kizomba and Semba, which is the styles that um, Walter danced to in the movie and Kuduro, which is the styles that Sylvia dances to. They're from Angola. They're hugely, just beautiful, um, intricate dance and Angolan people like dance with their whole bodies, you know? Um, and I wanted to be able to include that in a film, but specifically for Kizomba and Semba, um, it's, a, it's a partner dance, it's a very beautiful, sensual dance, um, but unlike other partner dances like salsa, for example, um, it does not, salsa has a regular foot pattern. So regardless of what your the leader of the dance requires you to do, turn this way, turn that way, you're doing the same thing over and over with your legs but Kizomba is not that way. You actually do need to have a connection with your dance partner in order to be able to know what they want, what you want, they want you to do. And in order to dance together, you actually need to be connected to each other in some way. And 
be paying attention. And so I just thought it would be an interesting metaphor for this couple that met, you know, probably at a Kizomba. Kizomba is a um, Kimbundu word, which means a party. Um, and they used to have these underground parties in Angola during the civil war, people weren't allowed to congregate. Um, and that's how people were kind of, were able to feel alive and remember themselves. So this couple that probably met in this kind of a situation, they were dance partners, they had the connection, they've lost the connection for a long time and now they're trying to regain it, but they can't because they're not in step. They, they're not able to dance together because they're not in step. Meanwhile, Walter is able to dance with, so he, he's found that connection with somebody else, quite literally as a dance partner. And so, what do you do? How how do you how do you fix that? So I just thought it was an interesting metaphor and a wonderful excuse to be able to showcase the beautiful music of Angola as well. <laughs> no, it was an incredibly beautiful metaphor. Thank you. You uh, briefly mentioned uh, exile. Um, so I have to ask, Epo, what is your African immigrant experience? How how did you end up here? How did you end up in filmmaking? Yeah, um, I'm fortunate to not have experienced exile or forced separation in the way that my characters have. My parents were Fulbright students um, in California, in the Bay Area in the late 70s when I was born. I have two older brothers. Um, and so I was born in the US um, to, you know, when my parents were students they finished their degrees, we moved back to East Africa. So I grew up in East Africa from, you know, age five onwards. And because I was an American citizen, I was able to come back to the US to go to school. I had decided um, while I was growing up here, you know, in the here being, I'm in Kenya right now. Um, and in Kenya in the eighties and nineties, we were fed a steady diet of American and British TV and film only. Um, there was never any um, imagery other than news imagery of our, cu our cultures, our customs, our people, our stories, like none of that. Even though East Africa has a very long history of being involved in a lot of big Hollywood movies going way back to the 30s, um, pretty much every big Hollywood film that was shot in Africa other than like maybe Lawrence of Arabia was shot in East Africa, but using East Africa just as a backdrop. So for the landscape, for the animals, maybe a random person way back in the background, but no stories about people here. So growing up, it always really frustrated me that the culture and the language and the color that I saw on a daily basis was never reflected anywhere. I could not see myself in anything. Um, and so I wanted to be a filmmaker to change that. So I decided to come back to the US as a teenager. Um, I was 17, so about the same age as Sylvia's character and decided to be a filmmaker not knowing anything about film. <laughs> I was just like, I'm just gonna do this. And I had seen, there was a one late night showing of one of Spike Lee's movies, School Days. I think I was about 10 or 11 and they, said at the top of the showing that he was a black filmmaker. And I was like, okay, great. He's a black filmmaker. I'll study what he did and I'll do exactly that. And I got into NYU, um, but it was, you know, and that was a journey in itself, of itself in terms of being in film school and, you know, not, not coming with the same sort of like love of cinema and having grown up with all these beautiful images that spoke to my heart and blah, blah. Like I had the complete opposite of that. Um, I came because I hated what I grew up with and I wanted something different. Mm. What was your experience uh, kind of reintegrating into American society then when you came at 17? I mean, it, was, it wasn't even a re-immigration at that point. It just was an immigration because, or integration um, because, you know, I left when I was so young for one and I had understood America from imagery, from the Cosby show, from Webster, from Casper the Friendly Ghost, whatever I, you know, was on TV and available to watch, which in and of itself, you know, and I speak to a lot of friends of mine who are African American um, or Lat you know, Latino American or you know, any other kind of culture outside of European American. Um, and most people don't feel like their stories were well represented either. So 
I came with certain expectations, which was not the case. Um, and I also came with expectations of like, I know so much about American culture. I know about proms, I know about jocks and you know prom queens and you know different things like that. But nobody knew anything about me, I had like absolutely no vision of who I was, what everyone was just like, wow, you speak English. This is amazing. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I was like a wild animal, basically. So it was um, confusing. It was confusing and upsetting because, and I couldn't understand why nobody knew anything of outside of like their little bubble. Um, you know, and that's a longer conversation to be had about American culture in general um, and how much we see outside of the US border, but also there's a very specific story that has been told to all of us, white and black people about who we are, what we are, what what's important to us, et cetera, what our history is, which I think at this point, it's really, exciting actually as an artist to see those walls crumbling and cracking and people being you know starting to question a lot more about like is that really is that really what we're doing is that really what's important to us is that really the actual story and not just in the us but even here on the continent um which is a very important reason for me to to remain a filmmaker is that you know there's the aspect of showing other people who we are, who we really are. We're not just like riding around on lions, but it's actually also sh more importantly for me is showing us who we are, like for ourselves, because we've also been miseducated about our own histories and our own, just everything. <laughs> you know, we adopted colonial education and sensibilities and all sorts of things. And we haven't actually had the opportunity to figure out for ourselves what's important to us. So that is work that I'm excited to do as a filmmaker. And we're excited to see it. We're excited to continue to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on your website, you state that one of your key goals as an artist is to transform our society's images and relationships with African cultures and to empower African filmmakers in telling their stories. Can you tell us a little bit more about what our society's images are and, and how Farewell Amor transforms those images. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, even in, you know, like asking anybody, ourselves included, and, and by ourselves, I mean like African people um, in the diaspora anywhere, um, what, you know, region X is like, what is North Africa like? You know, people have certain images because they've seen certain images and usually those are news images or rebellion images or, you know, certain certain clips that have kind of played over and over again. It's a little bit different now from when I was younger, um, thanks to YouTube, social media, like all of those things where people are able to, we're not just reliant on like the one news source to tell us who we are and show us. Um, but I think it's very limited. Um, I think it's very limited. I it, I think our images tend to be limited to, as I mentioned earlier, just either problems or the most, the one most exceptional person that ever lived. So there's like six Mandela movies and, you know, 13 like age, AIDS movies and Boko Haram movies and, you know, like all of these sort of different things. Um, and that that is dangerous. That is dangerous in the same way where for African-American culture, how many gangster movies have you seen versus movies about people just minding their business and going about their day, you know? Um, there's just, there's so much work to be done. So for me, and specifically with this film, Farewell Amor, I wanted to tell the stories of regular people. I wanted to tell the stories of regular people. Yes, they have challenges and problems that they're dealing with, but that does not make them. They just happen to be people ex who are experiencing problems amongst many other things that they're experiencing. They're experiencing love, they're experiencing joy, they're experiencing fear, all the things, you know? Um, and given how little of that we see, like the experience of folks <laughs> um, 
that in itself is revolutionary to see a grown African couple having consensual sexual relationship, <laughs> you know, as brief as it is, is historic. I have never seen that. You know, I can name probably on one hand any African films. Um, I think Safi Fai, who's a Senegalese um, filmmaker um, and made beautiful films in the 60s and 70s, and she still does. Um, she might have had like one or two films that actually showed like consensual, you know, <laughs> and it feels so like taboo. And but it's, I think that there's something inherently disturbing about never seeing anyone that looks like me like holding hands or kissing or having an intimate moment. It's like, I don't know. I mean, I grew up in a household where my parents would kiss each other. And so I actually have seen that, but most people haven't. And that's bizarre to me. <laughs> that's bizarre considering how much, you know, like I know sort of like the whole dating and courting scenarios for most white people, young and old, but to never see that of your own people. And that's just one example. Um, I just think that's really bizarre and therefore wanting to have that in my film to me is revolutionary um, and wanting to expand the um, ability for people to talk about, like to think about ourselves in that way um, is at least at this point, while I don't have a whole bunch of money to physically fund everybody's films, <laughs> is just sort of inspiring and encouraging other artists, African artists to like speak our truths and our experiences because I think they're interesting. Absolutely. Um, I love that you touched on the danger of uh, society's images. It makes me think of um, Nigerian writer Chimamanda uh, Ngozi Adichie, you know, has this incredible TED talk about the danger of a single story and that exactly. if we hear a single story about another person, we risk a critical misunderstanding of that person. Um, yeah. and, and I apply that to you know, what people's single stories are about about African people, um, yeah. especially in the United States or just in the Western worlds. Um, in a really beautiful, intimate moment between your characters, Walter and Sylvia, Walter tells her, this country is very hard for black people, especially foreigners. Can you further expand on that line and in what Walter was trying to explain to Sylvia? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there might be debate as to who it's more difficult for. <laughs> um, but at least in my view, I think that there is something very specific about being a foreign black person. And it's not, you know what, it's not even about where you are originate from, it's about your ability to assimilate. Um, I have a very American accent, depending on who I'm speaking to. <laughs> and so m my ability to maneuver in the US, um, depending on what I'm wearing and how I sound, I'm able to do certain things that, you know, my neighbor who has a very thick accent from wherever, whatever corner they're from, um, or has very specific features. There's some people who have very unassimilating features, <laughs> you know, um, that they can't, that's just who they are. And so wherever they go and no matter what they do and how they dress up, they will all, they will never be able to assimilate into just sort of like a regular American person. So, for Sylvia's story in particular, I think her journey is really about that choice of assimilation, choice or struggle with assimilating or not. Um, and it happens on, you know, for Walter's generation too, like how to navigate this world as yourself, as opposed to having to take on what other people expect that you should be and behave and things of that nature. And so in that moment, he's encouraging her to not assimilate, to not feel that pressure that that's the only way that she can survive is by becoming 
what she imagines American people to be or, or becoming what she imagines people want her to be. But just being herself and knowing that who she is is enough, um, which I feel like we all need to be told that. <laughs> I feel like we all need to be told that. And speaking of assimilation too, I will say, you know, that's, that's something that has affected white people as well. You know, that we all know we're all immigrants other than Native Americans, right? Everybody came to the US as an immigrant. And for a lot of white people, their early arrival, that was the struggle that they had too. And their assimilation has also meant sort of cutting off the old country and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm Italian American, but really I'm American. And so all these other people who are showing up and because of how we look, we're not able to, you know, slide in as easy. We get to be othered, you know, while this is like what's normal and you people are not. And I think that there's work there to be, you know, while we're doing all this, you know, race relation work that, you know, the spirit that we're in right now, I think there's something to be said for white people having to really look at their own assimilation stories and how they were forced to assimilate into a particular culture as well, because unless they do that work and heal those hurts, um, we're not going to get very far. They're not gonna get very far and it's holding all of us back really because there is something, there's a lot of pain and trauma around having to cut off, cut off your fingers, so, so to speak, like cut off appendages of, your, of who you are in order to belong and be safe here. Um, we should, nobody should have to live that way, I don't think. Thank you. Do you think you've assimilated well? I think I've had to learn how to assimilate in order to survive. Um, my family's from Tanzania. I grew up in Kenya. I was born in the US. I grew up in Kenya. I went to school in Brooklyn. I, <laughs> you know, I, my name is West African. Um, and so as a young person living in Kenya, I had to, even though Kenya and Tanzania border each other, um, there was very little that was known about, you know, we didn't know very much about each other. And so as a young person, I had to learn accents very quickly. I had to learn what was important to people. At that time, the government here was also very di dictatorial. And so ability to seem like you support, <laughs> you know, the mainstream was, you know, your life depended on it quite literally. Um, I mean, it wasn't a pressure that I had as a young person, but I could see that pressure on my parents and their friends and being like a neutral body that you didn't have opinions about the government. You didn't have opinions about whatever. Um, you know, it's the same thing that people talk about in the US about code switching. Um, you know, you come from a certain neighborhood or certain community and then you, I don't know, go to college somewhere and you have to speak a certain way in order for your teachers to take you seriously, in order for campus security to not assume that you're an intruder and throw you out, in order for, you know, people to want to do the group project with you, whatever it is. Um, there's ways that I think for all Black people, we have to learn how to assimilate to some degree. Um, and some of us can go back and forth. Some people are in positions where they can't go back. They have to just kind of go forward and that's it. Um, so yeah, I think I'm actually really good at it. Um, and I make it a point to learn a lot about other people's cultures, not necessarily so I can disappear into it, but so that I can find common ground um, in relating to people that I care about or I want to know more about. Um, I think Trevor Noah talks about it really well when he talks about his ability to um, speak lots of languages and do a lot of accents. You know, it's the same idea of being able to have people be comfortable and identify with you because you sound like them. Um, to me, that's part of my assimilation. I can't do any, I'm not as talented as Trevor is, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, I, I can understand a lot of accents and things like that. 
Thank you. What made you um, decide to show, you know, this three dimensional, uh, this three dimensional portrait of this family's immigrant experience? Why was that important to you as a filmmaker? Yeah, you know, it just as I was writing it. So I, I mentioned you mentioned actually that I had made a short prequel film to this farewell Mewa Moore, which um, you know I'd gotten a small cash award off of another film that I'd made, and it required me to make a short film within a certain period of time, and it wasn't a very big cash award, so I was trying to think of the smallest thing I could do. You know, one location, two people you know, just one day of shooting, <laughs> skeleton crew, what can I do? Sounds really um, producer. Yeah, exactly. Independent filmmaking. And um, I, I had a location, I could get access to a particular location. i had had this story in my mind for a while, you know, based off my uncle and aunt. And so I was like, all right, maybe I'll just do the moment before. Cause I had access to this one apartment that was just like, old and lived in and I just, and I could use it for free. <laughs> so what can I do in this apartment? He's in the apartment, it's the moment before he goes to the airport. What's, what is he doing? How is he preparing? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of where the journey started. So when I started working on the feature afterwards, his story was the freshest in my mind and it was easy to kind of go into writing about him, but. I thought it was a little cliche to write a story about a guy who had an affair because we've seen movies about men who've had affairs. And even though this one's a little different because he's, you know, he's dedicated to his family and you know he's having this real struggle. Um, so I was kind of toggling back and forth between, well, maybe I should make it from the daughter's perspective because I can certainly write about her journey being that I was about the same age when I came back to the U.S. Um, so initially the story was the father and the daughter um, mm -hmm. and wanting to just look at that experience. And as I was writing it, A, it became very clear that the mom's story was so important. It was like the linchpin to both of their stories. So it didn't make sense to not have her story in it. Um, but also the realization that even though they're all experiencing the same event, right? This reunion, they're having very unique experiences of the same event. Mm -hmm. um, they're all living in the same cramped quarters. They're all sort of happy and they all wanted the same thing. It's not like anyone there was like, no, we shouldn't have done this. You know, like, yay, everyone's on board, but everyone is having such a different and unique experience of that event. And so, you know, I just thought it would be a great opportunity to show more than one point of view of what this amazing event is like for each person, even while in the same room and at the same moment that, you know, we thought you were experiencing this, but actually you're experiencing something else. We later find that you were having a very different experience of what, you know, what I thought you were doing. So I just thought it would be a fun way to tell the story. Um, and I will say too that I think, you know, for me, it's also an experimentation or an expression of something that's very dear to me, which is African expression and the way that we tell stories is not linear, is not, you know, we're still discovering our voices as African artists um, because we've all been raised on foreign and Western filmmaking and filmmaking styles and story structure and all of these things, which is great, I believe in it, but where, like, how can we play with it? You know, how can we be different with it? And just listening to how people talk and people tell stories, I love, that's like one of my favorite things of all time is just like talking to people and listening to the ways in which they narrate stories and how the story goes here and there and like goes all over the place and so, it was my attempt to try and like trouble that um, traditional three act structure in a way that made sense to me and what I'm accustomed to, what I'm used to and what what my people around me are like in, if they were telling you this story, if somebody else was telling you, if somebody of African heritage was telling you this story, maybe this is a way that they might spin it. Mm. 
I love that. I love that. It you you know separating this story in, in these three different chapters, so to speak. Um, it, it was so it was so heartfelt, and mm-hmm. I can't help but think about. I mean, I closely related to this story in some aspect, just being an African immigrant. But I, I can't help but think of you know the, the U.S. has more than what fifty million uh, international immigrants, but mm-hmm. you did such a beautiful and intimate job in reminding us that each person that you know makes up this overwhelming like statistic so to speak has their individual set of perspectives and and experiences uh, yeah. that I couldn't necessarily relate to but it was still uh astounding so so thank, thank you. you thank you thank for you. that um it, it's funny that you mentioned earlier, you know, you didn't want to do that stereotypical story of uh, of a guy having an affair. You know, I will say when I read the synopsis, I remember telling uh, my best friend who's Nigerian, oh, I bet, I bet the main character has, has a single <laughs> girlfriend. I, I bet. I bet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, just when I thought I had the plot figured out, not only in that aspect, but in others, at every turn, your your screenplay veered away from the outcome that myself or perhaps another African um, might expect into this like far more beautiful and, and messier truth. Why? Why? Why do that? Why not just tell us? You know, why can't <laughs> you just have Linda the way that I thought Walter was going to have her? <laughs> because I wanted to keep you on your toes and life is not that life is that way right like it's never it's never just one thing it's never it's never that simple you know to me Walter was never just kind of like chilling in Brooklyn seeing other women dancing at the club and like all right I guess my folks are you know my family's showing up I'll go get them at like he was never that person, he probably held out for years, you know, and was so determined to like make this thing happen and met Linda because he needed something other than, I don't know, drinking and drugs or something like that. So he was dancing and he met this person and he had this connection with her and he probably told her right from the beginning, listen, I have a family and they're going to be joining me at any minute. And she was like, great, you know, that's wonderful. And we can just be friends. And, you know, and like love is like that, that you don't, it's not necessarily calculated where you're like, I'm going to go out and have an affair today and then I'll come back and see my family. <laughs> you, know? you know, he fell into love with this person because they were able to share something that he hasn't been able to share um, in a long time. And, I imagine there were all sorts of push pull feelings the whole way and, you know, were they living together? And, you know, she probably had some things at his house. I don't even think they actually, she lived there because she knew. They both knew that this was going to happen. But then, you know, after so many years, you're like, you kind of know, but is it really gonna happen? And then it happens. And now you're like, oh shit, (laughs) you know? the bubble that we were kind of living in has to change. And so, so I, you know, and it's, I don't know of personal stories. I really, you know, want to be clear that I don't think my uncle has had an affair. He's actually a very religious and pious man. (laughs) So not to like bad mouth uncle. Um, But I know a lot of people who are in New York, who have families back home, who have their kids, you know, like all these different circumstances. And it's not, it's not casual. I mean, to just put it that way, it's not a casual decision to be involved with somebody else, to want like some sort of companionship and a human connection with somebody else when you're lonely. And, you know, it wasn't just Walter either. I mean, Walter had a particular kind of affair with a particular kind of person, but Esther kind of had an affair too. You know, her affair was, I guess, a more, um, you know, it was a a type that is more, not agreed upon, but accepted, that's the word. 
because her affair was with Jesus, was with the church. You know, that's that's who she gave her life to. That's where all her attention and her love and affection and energy went to. And she had to. Neither one of them really had a choice, you know, in order to stay alive. This is what they had to do. And Jesus kept her hopeful and Linda kept him hopeful. <laughs> Um, and Sylvia had her dancing and her friends, and that's what kept her hopeful. And so what do you do now? We have to say goodbye to the lovers, right? So farewell, amor. I love that. I, I, I want to talk uh, just briefly about Esther's character. Um, you, you wrote her as a particular kind of African woman, I think one that uh, I surely did not uh, expect, you know, from her uh, curiosity about Linda to, um, again, the consensual sex and, and even her, uh, her love and, and desire for Jesus. Where, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Yeah, um, she's a conglomeration of all of my aunties. You know, my real life auntie has become very religious as her way of coping. Um, but I mean, across the continent, especially the Christian practicing parts of the continent, I'm not sure how it works with Muslims, but there's a lot of churches, a lot of new churches that have, you know, not your traditional sort of like Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever, but a lot of like new agey churches that tend to focus on women, focus on lonely women, focus on like getting married or having a partner or this, that, and the other, and come, we'll pray for you, come, we'll lay hands, come, we'll, some of them are very predatory, um, or they certainly seem that way. I've never been, but I've heard, <laughs> you know, some of them are quite suspicious and dubious. Um, but there is definitely a space where women are struggling um, with relationship, with this societal and religious pressure to be married, to have a husband, to keep the husband, to have the children, to raise the children. The, all the girls need to be virgins. All the boys need to have good jobs as doctors, you know, whatever it is. And yeah. <laughs> you know, and churches seems to be the one support system that's available for a lot of women of that type. And so, and I've seen different versions of that with all of my aunties. And so that was kind of an ode to the women in my families who, um, who that, that those are the options that they have, mm -hmm. that that's where they're able to express. That's, that's the, the container that they're able to be themselves. Um, and so that was the inspiration for her character. Um, but she's conflicted because she wants more, but is she allowed to have more? You know, that's her question. So what does more look like? What does that mean? Is it just more within this little cup or can I do something outside of the cup? Um, yeah, I love, I love her character so much. <laughs> I love that you say that, you know, this idea of, of wanting more. Um, it, it made me think about um, home and, and, and the definition mm -hmm. of home. Uh, I mean, you know, home is, um, can be so mythological for, for immigrants, period. But for, you know, uh, then all of your subjects, you know, what was home for Walter like for Esther and Sylvia who, you know, for the last 17 years, we're just trying to be reunited with, uh, with Walter and, and this, this idea that home could be family um, primarily. What is your definition of home, Equa? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think I have, being that I'm an immigrant, I've kind of grown up as an immigrant all over the place. Um, and I've adopted a number of different cultures. Um, Home is a number of different things for me. Um, home is a number of different places for me as well. But, you know, so I, I definitely have a home in Brooklyn and with people that I didn't grow up with or are not born of the same heritage as mine. Um, but those are the people that I rely on. Those That's my support system. Um, and I work to be their support system as well. And we are creating something together. We are 
we have a shared um, struggle, so to speak. Um, and then there's the home that I grew up in, which is Kenya. And that's a particular kind of home for me as well. And then there's my ancestral home, which is in Tanzania. And that's a home that is that is a different kind of home for me. Some of it is more attached to my parents and what's important to them um, and to the legacy and to the people who look like me and share the same names as I do, but it's not a place that I grew up. And so, it's a different kind of home. So I, I, for me, I don't have one answer, I guess is my point. It's just the home can look a lot of different ways. Um, but what's important to me is, you know, people that you love and people who love you and where you can feel, where you can be yourself, where you can be yourself and to grow and a, a place that you can grow um, for me is home um, for other people it might be a little bit more, um, you know, what the expectation is. It, a home should have a fence and should have a dog and should have a front entrance and a back entrance, you know, <laughs> et cetera. Um, I don't, I, I'm a little bit more flexible with what that looks like in my life. Do you think your characters were starting to experience home towards the end of the film? Or, I mean, you, you left us uh, on such a, on such a beautiful ending, one that I was very satisfied with. Um, Good. But do you think they were starting to to experience that? Um, I think that they, in my mind, where I left them was a place where they had made the decision that they were going to create home, that they were, so it wasn't the home that they had in their minds, the home that other people had told them it's supposed to be like, um, or they had anticipated that it was going to be like, but it was like, they were in a place where they're like, all right, let's actually like look each other in the face and decide for like together what we're gonna build, like how, what we're gonna build and how we're gonna build it. Um, that's, and not have the noise from all the other sources cloud, cloud the space. So, I think they also had a whiff of what home could be. Mm -hmm. You know, they they could have a chance to be themselves and not have to play these roles. Um, they had a chance to learn themselves, to learn themselves and learn each other um, in that in that small space. <laughs> what do you hope audiences step away thinking from Farewell More? Yeah, I hope that they. I hope that audiences come away with like a different experience of African people, of of love, of of a, a family like reaching for each other and trying to reach for connection um, with each other and the people around them as well. Just like a different, you know, there's. New York is a wonderful place in the sense that there's so many like little enclaves all over the city and you can literally like walk into a neighborhood and just like, it sounds like you are in a different world altogether. Like people are speaking English, but it doesn't sound like English or maybe they're not speaking English at all or, you know, and there are not many films that have been made about the Africans that live in New York. Um, and so there was, I wanted to sort of give a glimpse of what, somebody's life might be in New York as well. So that's, and just New York in general, cause I love New York so much. Um, so I wanted audiences to feel that and to just like experience this glow, you know, Angola because of language is not a place that people tend to discuss a lot um, outside of, I guess, sort of news or different kinds of things. Um, but in terms of the music and culture, they have such powerful music and cultures. So that's definitely something that I wanted to share as well as the human stories and the human connections that um, I wanted to share in the film. Thank you. Um, and, and you did, again, such a beautiful glimpse in, into that. What are your, your hopes and desires for African filmmakers and, and African storytelling and in the direction that uh, it, it's heading and and you like pushed you know you, you've you've made such a um a, a pivotal transition to to what it could be 
Thank you. Um, I'm so, I'm so excited about where we're heading. You know, we have, film is very expensive. So we haven't been able to produce a lot of it from the continent because of money barriers for, you know, for the most part, but with the advent of digital and sh people shooting on phones and YouTube and WhatsApp and, you know, all of this stuff, it's kind of leveled the playing ground for a lot of us, a lot of us worldwide, but certainly on the continent. And there's just a way in which, I mean, and this is true for black people across the board. There's a way in which we take things and just kind of like twist it and make it our own. You know, we do that with language, um, you know, the way that we'll speak English or French or Spanish or Portuguese or whatever language that we've been taught and we'll just make it our own. Um, you know, using words, creating new things like movement, you know, you know, just like a regular two-step can become like a whole entire other story if put in the hands of some young folks <laughs> or some black folks and people are just kind of like, what if we did it this way, you know? And so, and we've done that across the board with pretty much every single, everything, you know, sports and music and artwork and all sorts of other arenas, clothing, colors, you name it, fashion. Um, and so to me, film is just like the next frontier. It's like the things we will do with this, you have no idea. <laughs> I don't even think my mind can fathom where we'll go but I, I do know that it's going to be amazing and I'm excited to see the way that we will reimagine storytelling, reimagine like capturing images and sound and the use of like all of the elements um, in terms of telling stories. Cause we tell stories like that is, that is our jam all day long. Um, so, so I'm very, very excited about how that will play out especially with the use of technology and having that be more readily available to people across the continent. Um, and it's something that I hope to continue pushing myself um, and collaborating with other people to, to keep striving for and not, just, um, and not just settling for what was and what worked and what is marketable or what somebody's in some studio somewhere thinks is great, but what do we think is great? Like, what do we want to see? What is interesting to us um, and to my eye and to my palate um, is something that I hope to challenge myself and help to challenge other people as well. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one last question for you, because I know we're coming up on the hour mark. Um, I know we're currently in the midst of a pandemic, uh, yes. but tell me, one place or, or several in the African continent that you would love to visit or you would encourage others to visit once this pandemic is all over? Once this is over. Um, I unfortunately have not traveled to many places, to as many places as I would like to travel. None, not many know this, but travel on the continent is actually very, very expensive and difficult. <laughs> But all of the places that I've been, I actually love every one of them. Of course, I you know I grew up in Kenya, and that has a very particular like energy to it. Like people here are just so uh, just brilliant and able to kind of work around problems in ways that is really quite fascinating. Um, East Africa, in particular, is 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 very particular in our history with colonialism, our history with you know, liberation and with each other and migration and all of those kinds of things. Um, Tanzania, of course, you know, with, you know, just like our people, our landscape and just listening to stories and, you know, as much like listening to people talking is just like so joyous to me. Um, I've been to Nigeria before, which fascinates me to no end, just because the, the energy that they have is just like, on steroids <laughs> compared to anywhere else that I've been. And it leaves me mind boggled all the time. I just feel like I'm holding on for dear life, but I'm also like completely fascinated by it. Um, I haven't been to Senegal, but I desperately want to. Um, that's to me just like a film mecca um, in a lot of ways, just because of how many beautiful artists have come out of that region. Um, and South Africa and 
their um, history, especially to do with, um, you know, just like people creating their own voice out of what was, um, to me is, is just really beautiful and fascinating as well. And I, I still haven't been to North Africa. That's like the one region that I haven't touched yet. Um, Congo for dancing, Congo and Angola, good Lord. I mean, like the music that comes out of there. I know Afrobeat is really big and it's amazing, but Congo, Angola, like that's where it started. <laughs> that is Wakanda, that is where it started. Everyone needs to pay homage. That's what I think. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. Perfect. So visit all of these places. Yeah, um, all of them. <laughs> y'all heard her. Uh, well, Ekwa, thank you so much for spending time with me this morning, especially all the way from Kenya. Uh, you know, yeah. us at Black Lens and Milwaukee Film, we sincerely appreciate you. Thank you for Felwer for Farewell More. Uh, what an incredible film! I can't wait to see. Uh, the work that you continue to do. I will be fangirling uh, <laughs> the entire way. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate um, it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone for tuning in right and early with us. We really appreciate you. You can check out Farewell Amore along with other beautiful films during the final days of the 2020 Milwaukee Film Festival. Visit mkefilm.org or watch.mkefilm.org to check everything out. You have until October 29th. Thank you again, everyone. Stay safe, stay blessed. Uh, peace. <laughs>